Um, I know we've all had a bit of a long day and a long week. There's been a lot going on. So in the interest of uh, moving things forward, I'm going to start. Uh, if anybody wants to come in late, that's totally OK. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming out to our talk today. Uh, my name is Aaron Unger. I'm the Director of Product Development with the British uh, Government of British Columbia, not the British of Government Columbia. <laughs> I lead the Digital Identity and Trust Program with the Ministry of Citizen Services. If anybody was at the keynote this morning, John Jordan is our Executive Director, um, and I work for John. Uh, I've worked for provincial governments across Canada for the last 16 years, uh, focusing on open source software and leading teams to deliver effective open source, open source software. Uh, in our, my current role, I lead multiple teams. Uh, you maybe saw Clesio and Akif talk yesterday. Um, and Steven's talk today, they're some of the teams that we work with, and we're working to innovate and reshape the digital credential space in British Columbia. Uh, BC's Digital Trust Program represents the government's commitment to delivering easy to access digital solutions that can be trusted to be safe and secure. Digital credentials enable safe interactions online and offer people and businesses more control when and where they share their data about themselves online. And again, I'm going to refer us to Stephen and Klesio and Keith's talks about more of the technical matters on that, but that's, those are our initiatives. Um, sp specifically today, we're going to talk about a different use case and a different initiative uh, in more detail. Um, as a global movement builds towards low carbon and net zero strategies, governments are working to ensure the natural resource sector products are sustainably sourced. With me today is Kyle Robinson. Kyle's a senior strategic advisor. He's an independent consultant for the Energy and Mines Digital Trust Project with TELUS and the government of BC. He's an expert on digital trust technology. In fact, I ask him questions every day about it. <laughs> he's got over 20 years of experience in IT business with government clients. And he's an active member of the Hyperledger Identity Special Interest Group and several trust over IP working groups. So, Kyle, I'm going to ask you, can you tell us more about the Digital uh, Energy and Mines Digital Trust Initiative and what exactly is EMDT? Uh, sure. So, um, EMDT is uh, Energy Mines Digital Trust, and it's an initiative that was started in 2019. We're going to figure out the date later, but um, 2019. And so it's been going for a while. Um, originally, it was uh, working on both the use case uh, for energy and mine, uh, ener or mining specifically, um, recently, we've added energy uh, use cases to that. Um, but on the mining side, uh, even Aaron was uh, involved back in the early days there. Um, and there was a technology component also uh, involved with that initiative. So there, we had a development team uh, working on uh, the business partner agent, which is a Hyperledger Aries uh, component. Um, and then you know, there's a long history through all of the EMDT. Uh, we've now done uh, a component called Traction, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, which has now been moved over to the citizen services side. Um, and so that's the technology piece. But um, more importantly, today we're talking about the use case. And so um, we'll, we'll get into some of the, the details later. Um, the digital trust ecosystem, though, is... Um, as you heard maybe in some of the other talks, uh, use of verifiable credentials to do uh, these transactions between the different uh, parties uh, that we see on this diagram here, and you also have that on your paper. Um, so on the left-hand side, you'll see the, in general, those are the issuers um, who are uh, creating credentials and issuing to, uh, on this diagram, we have Copper Mountain Mine in the middle. Um, We've been working with some other companies as well, uh, but uh, we're talking about Copper Mountain today. And then on the right-hand side, we can see those are the consumers of the verifiable credential data. Um, and so we have our, our typical uh, issuer holder verifier uh, trust triangle. Um, we're using Hyperledger Indy um, as our verifiable data registry for this solution as well. Excellent. Thank you, Kyle. And beside Kyle is Japcheet Krod. She's a senior sustainability specialist with Copper Mountain Mining Corporation. And as you can see on the graphic, uh, Copper Mountain Mining Corporation is one of EMT, EMDT's ecosystem participants in the natural resource sector. Uh, she's responsible for coordinating the company's ESG objectives, performance, and their reporting. Uh, she's an initiative leader for the Mining Association of Canada towards sustainable mining program within the company. And Japcheet, can you tell me a little bit about your involvement with EMDT and your experience? 
Thank you. Um, so our company got involved with EMDT, and we were part of the two pilot projects. Uh, one is the Towards Sustainable Mining uh, um, pilot, and the other one is uh, GHG reporting. Um, so uh, we had a couple of working sessions where we, uh, you know, try, uh, where EMDT tried to understand what what the current workflow is uh, within mining companies, how they are reporting uh, to TSM or to BC government on their GHG performance. Uh, so we looked at the user personas and journey maps, uh, where the information, uh, uh, you know, where it starts and how it's collected and how it gets verified and how where all it is shared. And at each stage, uh, what are the pain points of various uh, stakeholders, and uh, um, how can that be made more efficient? So that was the whole uh, purpose. And um, so uh, we did the TSM use case, uh, which is a um, voluntary standard, which uh, can help companies showcase that they are uh, uh, having responsible practices at their mine site. Uh, so this uh, uh, digital credential can really help mining companies to uh, uh, share credible ESG data with their, uh, you know, parties that are interested in that data, and uh, yeah. So uh, so far, the pilot has been great, and I think there's a great potential for digital technology in uh, the mining sector. Thanks, Jeff Sheet. That's excellent. Um, so talking about the use case, I'm going to ask Kyle the next question and flip to our next slide. Uh, Kyle, can you uh, describe how can digital trust technology enable sustainability reporting and talk about the use case a little bit more? Yeah, so um, one of the things that we worked with uh, with Copper Mountain and also the Mining Association of Canada, um, they're the actual governing authority of that TSM protocol, which is an international uh, protocol uh, recognized in 12 different countries um, for, for mining specifically. Uh, so we, uh, it took us a while to figure out the actual stories and, and working with Copper Mountain, we, we figured it out. Um, but uh, in general with the TSM, um, it's a self-assessed um, scorecard um, in a number of different categories. And uh, every third year, they need to report it every year to the Mining Association of Canada. Um, every third year, it needs to be third-party audited. And now, the interesting thing about this verifiable credential exchange is it's all holder-driven. It's all starts that each transaction, um, part A and part B, they both start with the holder, um, in this case, Copper Mountain. So Copper Mountain, Japjeet specifically, will fill out the scorecard on the work that Japjeet does um, for uh, uh, checking all those different categories, filling out our own scorecard, then sends it over to, in this case, it's Envirochem, which is a third-party auditor, and uh, they check those scores, uh, do their due diligence, and then they actually do the digital uh, signature on it. Um, th that issuer is a trusted issuer according to that TSM protocol, um, which is a, a list managed by the Mining Association of Canada so that they can actually issue a, a signed credential back to Copper Mountain. Now Copper Mountain has that credential and they can use it for all kinds of different use cases. Um, the, um, and then Copper Mountain can use that for uh, checking their membership with the Mining Association of Canada, um, but we're also working with other consumers of that same information. Um, yeah. Excellent, thanks. Uh, building on that a little bit, uh, Japjeet, I'm gonna ask you, what are some of the potential benefits of digital trust technology for companies in the mining sector? Sure, um, I think digital, uh, digital creden credential technology, it can uh, really help us achieve efficiencies in our current workflows. And uh, we can share the same information with multiple stakeholders just with one click away. And uh, it can, you know, uh, improve the accuracy of the data. So once the credential has been issued, it cannot be tampered and the verifier who is issuing the credential has like all the right to you know, uh, finalize it and then nobody can uh, tamper it and we can share it with uh, different stakeholders. And that builds uh, trust between our company and our stakeholders that the information they are getting is credible, it's verified and has not been tampered and such, um, uh, you know, trust is required when you are dealing with global supply chains and they want to make sure their, uh, you know, the minerals that they're sourcing, uh, whether it's uh, Mercedes or BMW, they want to know that how they're, uh, the metals that they're sourcing, uh, how they're produced. So uh, that trust is really important here, I think. 
Excellent. Thank you. And I know uh, one of the things Energy and Mines, the Ministry of Energy and Mines talks about uh, a lot. I, I was a, an employee there for a long time. The, the catchphrase was mining done right. And BC has a commitment to doing mining uh, sustainably and ethically and all those sorts of things. So, um, Kyle, did you have anything you wanted to add? Um, um, yeah, so uh, one of the things that we're starting to see is this um, use case that we're talking about is really sort of the tip of the iceberg for, you know, what these uh, credentials are used for. We're also exploring um, into the supply chain uh, space and how these credentials can use, be used uh, for organizations to prove their sustainability in supply chain solutions. Um, we've been talking with uh, Sherwood and, and Bertrand about, you know, maybe something there um, in the future, but... Uh, yeah, that's that's still to be seen. Um, we're not there yet. Um, this we see as uh, really the f still foundational credentials um, from the government's uh, perspective. Um, we're also working with the um, Mines Digital Services and uh, looking at doing a, a Mines Act permit. So that's a permit uh, to be issued by the BC government. In in this case, it would be to Copper Mountain uh, as well. So then they have multiple credentials to use for these different use cases. Nice. Okay. Uh, next question. How is the TSM use case supporting the global scaling of... Oh, Stephen, you got a question? a question? Yes, you should. So I'm intrigued by this idea that Copper Mountain produces the data and then Virochem audits and signs. Who gets liability there? How do, is that maybe a theoretical question, but is it because Copper Mountain produced it that if someone finds it's not So annually, we assess ourselves, uh, but every three year, every third year, there is an external verification. And whenever we are self-assessing, our CEO signs that you know the information <laughs> we are presenting to Mining Association of Canada, it is true. And uh, the auditor then comes; it's a detailed audit, and they provide us recommendations as well. But you know, just checks that whatever we've done is it's the same. And there some there are minor changes sometimes, but not really. Uh, we are pretty accurate in assessing ourselves. Uh, so then the liability, I, I can say, is on American in the third year, but really it's the CEO of the company who has the liability. Nice. That was a great question. Any other questions? And we can take some more after we're done, but okay. Um, so talking about uh, scaling this globally, how can the TSM use case support the global scaling of digital trust technology? So uh, TSM is a globally recognized uh, initiative, and it's uh, been adopted by companies across uh, six continents. And uh, it's, it's, it has well-established uh, verification and auditing process, and companies can easily adopt to it. And having a digital credential for TSM, I think it's pretty useful for companies across the globe. And therefore, digital credential can have global presence. Um, you want to add yeah. anything to that? Yeah, so the other aspect of uh, the scalability is uh, we were actually worked a lot on the governance um, for this use case. Um, so working with the trust over IPs um, model uh, for there's a technology stack and a governance stack, the governance is all around who is the governing authority for the thing that we're talking about in the ecosystem. And so top to bottom, uh, we wrote governance uh, documentation using the metamodel specification from trust over IP for um, what well, already existed for the uh, ledger networks that we were using. Um, working on it with um, Northern Block is the actual um, uh, instance that we're using for uh, this use case. Um, so this is not uh, like Copper Mountain isn't using a government hosted wallet. It's a privately hosted wallet through Northern Block. Uh, so they have their governance structure. Um, the two that we focused on mostly, though, for this uh, use case was the governance for the TSM protocol itself. Um, fortunately, there is lots of documentation on the TSM uh, uh, model and the protocol itself online. It's just an, an essentially a paper type of a form. Um, they actually have a Mining Association of Canada has a web form that uh, people go and fill out right now. Um, so we took that uh, governance uh, information and translated into a verifiable credential format. So created a schema um, and, and you know good documentation around that. 
Um, and then uh, at the very in the trust over IP model, um, there is an application layer at the top, and that's where we worked specifically with EnviroChem, the Mining Association of Canada, and Copper Mountain, because they're all three participants in you know doing their own thing. They all needed their own um, uh, governance structure uh, for the uh, thing, the parts that they play uh, in this ecosystem. So nice, that was really good. It was. <laughs> By the way, the governance uh, documentation we actually put onto GitHub, so it's uh, open source, <laughs> open standard, yeah. They have a very nice GitHub page. If anybody does want to visit, it is really well done. Um, so next question, uh, can we talk a little bit about the open source technology that e uh, enables your ecosystem? Yeah, so um, as I mentioned earlier, um, in the, the wider ecosystem, not just the, yeah, so on this pi picture here, we'll talk about this a little bit. Um, so traction is the um, component that our Energy Minds Digital Trust team uh, was working on. Uh, now it's uh, used for many different uh, ministries. Uh, and so we see on the left-hand side, Energy Minds Low Carbon Innovation and BC Registry Services in this pilot. Uh, would be used traction to issue credentials. In this case, it is the business registration and a Mines Act permit uh, to Copper Mountain. Um, all of the boxes that have a blue border on them, those are Northern Block um, instances. And so we see PwC at the top. We're also working with them. Um, there, we, we haven't done a lot with them recently, but that's going to be coming this year. Um, EnviroChem, though, is uh, we did a test with the um, Northern Block solution all the way through. Um, I think we have a link to a video on our on our website, which you can access uh, with the information in the in the handout. The um, and so those uh, in PwC and EnviroChem, they're the ones that are issuing that towards the sustainable mining credential. As we Jeep mentioned, that's every third year um, when that actually happens. Um, and then presented on the other side to the Mining Association of Canada. That's they're consuming uh, three different credentials in this use case. So it'll be the TSM, the Mines Act permit, and the uh, business registration. Now, um, the other one that we've added on here we didn't talk about yet is the uh, LEI. And so that's something to enable international trade um, for critical mineral supply chain, uh, those kinds of things. Um, in the bottom right-hand corner, that's the LME is the London Metals Exchange. So we're working with them it's still early days, uh, but they're going to be consuming uh, credentials in the same way uh, to allow there to be international trade into the London Metal Exchange. Um, so, and Europe has lots of regulations even today uh, for actually importing critical minerals. So that's that's what we're using that for. Uh, the VLEI is um, the verifiable version of an LEI, which is a legal entity identifier. Um, and that's it's very similar to a business registration, but it's internationally recognized. Um, and to pile on the, the Mines Act permit that, you, that Kyle mentioned, uh, we're talking with the ministry uh, about that use case. The Mines Act permit proves that uh, Copper Mountain, for example, has uh, you know the right to, not only the right in the tenure, but the actual permit to disturb the land, disrupt the land, and produce uh, copper, in your case. <laughs> and uh, they have all kinds of responsibilities within that permit to do reclamation and all sorts of things. So BC goes through a really rigorous process to permit mines, and the, the instance of that permit proves that Copper Mountain is uh, committed to those and has a signed agreement that they will uh, mine responsibly. Take care of environment. Yes, exactly. That's what I was trying to <laughs> just, just to pile on to that as well. The um, Part of the membership uh, rec um, requirements for the Mining Association of Canada is proof that it, they have an operation within Canada. And so we think that the Mines Act permit can fulfill that um, requirement as well, which is, also goes alongside the TSM, but it's still separate. I'm going to pause for a couple of questions. Does anybody in the audience have any questions for us? I've been asking them all so far, so I feel like you can have a turn. I'm going to pause for one more second, and then I'm going to keep asking questions. <laughs> OK. So um, Japcheet, how else might Copper Mountain use digital trust technology to improve their business processes? Um, 
So we can use digital credential for any other verifiable information. For example, like our financial auditing information, if, you, if it is verified by PwC or any other auditor, we can uh, share it through digital credential and achieve efficiency. And um, um, so once we have any digital credential, we can, like I mentioned, we can share it with multiple stakeholders annually. It will save a lot of our time, administrative uh, time. And uh, uh, I think, um, like, for not just for Copper Mountain, but for any company who has who want to take any sort of ESG credential, whether it's TSM or any future um, mandatory requirements, for example, the IFRS requirements. So credential can also be issued for that, and digital credential can be used, uh, and we can use it to share with a lot of stakeholders. Nice. Excellent. And just to add to that, um, one of the other things that we um, tested out a little bit through our, our pilot process was actually using the, the Hyperledger Aries or uh, DIDCOM connection uh, to do basic messaging uh, back and forth. So that's the secure end-to-end -end, uh, communication that uh, what we can set up in the cloud-based uh, solutions is a direct connection between, let's say, EnviroChem and Copper Mountain. And so they can do a chat basically back and forth um, to help negotiate some of the um, proof requests. So in the use case that we're looking at here, um, Copper Mountain fills out all their information. They could quickly send a, a message over to Neil at EnviroChem and say, hey, I'm about to send it over. Can you take a look? Um, those kinds of things. So notifications would be you know, important for that. Um, and then he can send a message back and forth while they're negotiating the actual scores on the, the, um, the TSM scorecard. Um, not using email, not using phone, not using SMS, um, or you know those kinds of. Uh, so this is all peer-to-peer -peer encrypted um, uh, information. Bertrand. Yes. Yeah. Do you want um, more details about that, or is that good? Well, let me get into my specific question. Okay. Uh, like, say, you mentioned this, you spoke specifically about Enviro, Enviro Cam, which is the audit, the external auditor, for example, of Copper Mountain. Um, and you mentioned a three-year cycle. So my first, right, mm -hmm. on the external audit, mm -hmm. we do internal audits annually, the standard. The three-year, first of all, the three-year period, is that sort of standard for the mining industry, or is that something? Let's just assume, as an exercise, that in that three-year period, it's found that copper mine, I don't think this is the case, but it's no longer compliant with its uh, external audit requirements. Um, the credential is still valid, but the, they can still present it as a valid peer-to-peer -peer credential, correct? There's no external way to ver or verify that, you know, that the credential is now in, in default. And assuming, you know, it's been audited for, you know, to operate for three years, or is it just saying that the audit said during that three years? Um, I can talk about the Mines Act permit a little bit and what that talks about, which is a little bit to the side of what you asked. And then, Jepji, do you want to answer the rest of that? Okay. So in, uh, in the Mines Act permit that Copper Mountain Mine has, and I don't know specifics about theirs, but the ministry won't issue a permit without having a requirement for a five-year mine plan. Uh, they won't issue a permit without having a requirement for annual reclamation reporting. So Copper Mountain Mining is re required to report to Energy and Mines, the ministry, every year. Uh, we had this much tonnage this year. We did this much reclamation. This is what we're planning for next year. And there's many more details about that. They have requirements annually about tailing storage management um, and what they're doing about that. And they'll have to report, like, again, I'm not a geotechnical engineer, so apologies, but they'll have to report on their tailings management every year. They'll have to report on reclamation, all those things within their Mines Act permit. And the, the permit would be revoked if they were not uh, acting accordingly. So that's the other side of this. So you talked about annual reporting and things like that. They have those sorts of things, but then the EnviroChem piece, I'll let Jeff Cheat answer that part. Yes. Yes. 
So uh, TSM. <laughs> So, so one is the uh, like the legal requirements and the permit, which um, uh, Aaron has talked about, and uh, TSM is voluntary ESG, you know, certification. So it's uh, I would say it takes companies above and beyond what is required every year. They are revising their protocols based on you know best practices across the globe. So they are raising the bar for companies every year, and uh, so. So when we say every third year we get a verification, so in the credential, correct me if I'm wrong, Kyle, so it will show that in the third year it is a verified credential through EnviroChem, and that will be for that particular year. And in the next two years, if it is a self-assessed credential, it will show that it is, it is just oh, a self. So you guys, you guys publish your internal audit as a, credential, as a self assessed credential. That was actually a yes. question I didn't ask, but I was curious about it. So yeah. you are, so you are signing off on your own Yes. Okay, that's interesting. So your internal auditors are doing also external audit with that. Yeah. With the same system. Yeah, but the same. Yeah, and, and one other thing to, to consider for this is um, the, the Mining Association of Canada, like the, the specific three-year period is to um, prove um, your membership in the Mining Association of Canada. Um, but like the London Metal Exchange, they might not have a three-year you know, requirement. That might be every year. Um, we don't. We, we haven't uh, worked out all those details yet, right? Um, to, to what they need to see on their side. So um, there, there's different uses for those credentials, um, but the three-year period is specifically for membership proof. Um, so the Mining Association of Canada is checking membership every three years. Um, uh, you know, from the, that third-party audited, and then the the self-assessed is just making sure that you do that that report. Um, Steven. Just for a wee bit of fun on the technology side, you would usually have an expiry date in the credential itself, and you have capability, you can have capability to the issuer to revoke the credential at any time. So in, in your scenario, if your require EnviroChem that did the audit, issued the credential, and then later find out things weren't as we thought, they can unilaterally No. So, so the, way yeah. work is, uh, the way the technology works is you revoke it, the issuer revokes it. When they go to present it again, yeah. they would not be, they would, there would be show that it's not, okay, so there has been revoked. There is an intermediary that's checking for the validity of the credential. So it's part of producing the presentation. Okay, food. all right. Um, yeah. They have to construct what's called proof of non replication. <laughs> yes, yeah, I, I mean, I've read through the Amon thread. Yeah. We won't get yeah. Don't be sorry for no asking problem. good questions. <laughs> yeah, the, the other thing uh, we've heard, I, I can't remember if it was this specific use case, but um, some verifiers or consumers of data on the right-hand side might be asking for the last three years' worth of records. Uh, so not just the latest, but show us you know, your history. Show us your 2020, 2021, and 2022 scores. And they could ask for all of that. Um, to be checked on a regular basis. And they could ask that every year. Give me the last three, give me the last three. So it'll include self-assessed and uh, that third party audited. Any f more questions? We're happy to take a couple more. We've got a bit of time. That was a nice hit of dopamine. It's been a couple of years since anybody asked me a mine permitting question. <laughs> Um, Kyle, you have a question for me oh. in the case of extra time. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so next to EMDT, what other use cases are there for digital trust technology with the BC government? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> There's the answer. So uh, 
if you uh, alluded to this earlier, we've had a couple talks at this uh, so far at OSS this week, but I'll just briefly touch on them again. Uh, we've got the BC Wallet. So Klesio sitting uh, back there is the product owner on the BC Wallet team. Uh, and the BC Wallet enables us uh, with our uh, person credentials, uh, personal credentials to do a couple of different things. So chiefly the one we have live right now, and you can download and practice a showcase from our showcase website. Uh, but this is in production. We've got uh, a couple hundred lawyers in the province. They've got a law society credential. It says, I am a lawyer in BC with a credential issued from the law society and I am in good standing. They have that credential on their phone. They also have on their phone, those same lawyers have a credential that says I am a person. And that person credential is issued by BC Registries, Service BC. Sorry, Service BC, not BC Registries. <laughs> um, and that says they are a person. And they take that person credential and that lawyer credential, they take those to a website called Access to Court Materials. It was in John's video this morning very briefly. And they are given access to that website. Uh, they're able to prove in one step, presenting both credentials at once, they're a lawyer in good standing and they are a person with a name that matches that lawyer in good standing credential. Um, and they're given access to core materials, which they previously would have had to drive to the courthouse to retrieve. Uh, it saves them a lot of time and effort. It's uh, expedited a lot of processes and uh, we're scaling that one up right now. Um, and then the other one that John talked about this morning was Orgbook BC. Can I get a show of hands for anybody who's ever been to Orgbook BC? Everybody on our team. <laughs> Orgbook BC is a searchable public directory of all the registered businesses in BC. It's a really fantastic site. Uh, it's an API that you can hit. I've hit it on two other Government of BC initiatives that I've uh, worked on. It provides fantastic in information directly from the source. Um, and our team manages that site as well and that API. Um, in addition, we are working on expanding the lawyer use case. We're looking at other places that a lawyer might present their credentials, so essentially looking for new verifiers. Where else might a lawyer need to prove they're a lawyer? Um, if you talk to Kyle or Klesio or Keith and I in the hallway, we can show you the mobile verifier that we've built into the BC wallet. We're happy to do a demo. Um, and yeah, those are a couple of the things we have going on. Great question, Kyle. <laughs> Yeah. So that was the end of our slides and our talk. Um, we're still a little bit ahead of time if anybody has any questions. Um, but I really want to thank everybody for coming out, asking thoughtful questions. This is something we're really passionate about. Uh, I know we had a, a handout. It, if everybody got one or is interested, we can uh, get more. You can also uh, go and find them online. And. There's our contact information. Maybe make up for the last five minutes a bit. So I mean, so you guys have energy in your name, which means you're not trying to reach for the totality of the foreign, you know, similar applications, say in the natural gas and the energy space. Um, and maybe I could, you know, dive in a little bit or get some information from you on Okay, so I'll go back in time a little bit. Um, so um, we did add the energy component to the Energy Minds Digital Trust Initiative last year. Um, so we've been working, we were working with um, uh, government entities um, on both sides uh, for the actual uh, GHG emissions. Uh, Jeff Cheat mentioned the greenhouse gas emission um, type of credentials that we worked, we worked with Copper Mountain as well on. Um, and so, we expanded our ecosystem quite wide um, for our pilots um, to see where the highest value was um, and the you know, most energetic adopters and you know, that kind of thing. Um, so that's sort of a, a strategy that we uh, went through. Um, coming through that, we um, finished up a round of funding that we were uh, doing all this initiative under. Uh, at the end of March, and so going into this year, we got more funding uh, to continue on. And uh, so now what we've done is taken our learnings from last year 
And so we're applying those uh, to focus in on uh, the mining uh, use case. Our goal with the mining use case um, that we had up on, on the, and that's on your, your handout there, the goal this year, so in 2023, is to get that to production. Um, it's, it's still in a pilot stage. We're working very closely with Mining Association of Canada, with Copper Mountain, with EnviroCam, with other adopters in that space, um, as well as our partner Northern Block, because um, that's the you know technical solution uh, to do this for the private sector. Um, you know, we didn't talk about it, but um, the credentials that EnviroCam would be issuing would actually be issued on the Sovereign Network. Um, you know, that Hyperledger Indy, because uh, again, it's all uh, private based. And so there's a lot of things to work through for that just on the mining side. And so we're, we're trying to manage the scope of uh, the work that we're doing in the next year. Um, but we do have, you know, the energy piece still sort of in mind. It's just kind of a little bit on the back burner, um, uh, but we're still, you know, engaging in, in conversations there. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much, yes. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's interesting um, working through all these the pilots that the work that we did last year was um, the value um, comes from the verifier actually. So you got to look at the very end consumer of the information because they are the one that's driving to say I want this data for this purpose. And this, you know, we yeah. Yeah, and and that's the the consumer of the data is on the and right and so they're driving the market to say this is the data that we want this is why we want it right um, yeah that's right that's right yeah. Uh, so we're we're already using well. So the Sovereign Network, um, S-O-V-R-I-N, is um, a, a Hyperledger Indie network um, that's used worldwide. It's um, privately run, essentially, you know, but but public. Um, so you need to pay. You need to pay to be an issuer on that, um, to issue uh, to be an issuer and to issue credentials on that. It's actually part of the solution. Like if we were to draw out the proper diagram of that, like there's a bunch more components um, to that. Um, Yeah, yeah, but but that said, so you know the the government won't be issuing on sovereign; they'll be issuing on a different ledger. The interesting thing that we can do is correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen. Um, the Mining Association of Canada can consume three credentials across multiple uh, Indie networks in one transaction. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's when that presentation is done with those three credentials for that, you know, that third year report. Um, it's got a ton of information in it, all packaged into one transaction. So they're all connected, all, all those different pieces are connected together in that one's transaction. Um, when it receives those, it'll be, you know, checking against those separate ledgers for proof of non-revocation to see that they're not been revoked and, you know, that they're not tampered with and those kinds of things. Uh, no, no. The the borders are the actual different um, hosted solutions. I, we don't actually have the ledgers listed on this diagram, but um, yes, <laughs> yeah. I'll talk to you about mining all you want later. <laughs> yeah, I'm way deep into it. Um, I think we're getting close to time. Is there any last question? Uh, we're happy to talk in the hallway for a few minutes as well. Thank you everybody for coming out. Thank you.